All right, I'm going to stay back here today uh, so that my computer recognizes. If I'm up close to the board, it won't pick up my audio with all the fans going. Um, all right, so 2-2 two, two is, is conditional statements. 2-1, uh, we're going to kind of skip over right now. Uh, a conditional statement doesn't really have a good definition. Our textbook doesn't have a great definition for it. Um, but this is what we're going to go by right now. Uh, a conditional statement is what we call an if-then statement. Okay? An if-then statement. A conditional statement, if we think about uh, kind of what Alex was saying is, uh, maybe put in a better terms, is that it's a statement in which some requirement needs to be met for some conclusion to be true. So a requirement needing to be met so that a conclusion turns out to be true. Okay. Um, if this happens, then this is true. Something like that. Okay. Uh, you you see if then statements all the time. Okay. Your your existence and your ability to navigate your world is full of the ability to recognize if then statements and adapt to them. Okay. And react to them. Okay. Uh, if your alarm went off this morning, then you did what? You either snoozed it, you woke up, you got ready to school, all that kind of stuff, right? But every time that you do a reaction to something, it generates essentially a new decision to be made, right? A decision process. And those decision processes are laid out as if-then states. If you have any experience with coding uh, or programming computers, it's all about if-then states, okay? You guys play, you know, I watch Alex every once in a while, quizzes over and he's playing games, right? Just fine, okay? But He's, he's jumping around, he's pushing all these keys, and how's the character know what to do when he's pushing these keys? There's programming behind that says, if user pushes the up arrow, then character jump, right? Okay? So, if then statements inundate our lives, all right? Uh, and, and they are how all of our algebra, geometry, any level of mathematics is kind of um, provided for us, how it's all written out, and okay, how we understand it. This section in this chapter are going to start getting us to think a little bit different about mathematics than what we currently think. We think right now that mathematics is about calculating, right? About adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing, about doing procedural things like factoring, uh, foiling, all that kind of stuff, which it is, and that, that stuff's nice. But what allows you to factor? Why, what allows you to foil? Why, why can I do these operations uh, at these certain times? We're going to start talking about the, the reasoning of why we have the math that we have and why we do it the way we do it. Okay? Uh, and, and all these rules that we have are laid out in the offense statements. Okay? So, um, as you progress now through this course and, and all the other courses after this mathematically, you're going to practice all your arithmetic, you're going to practice your procedures and your, your steps of doing a particular problem. But there should be guidelines and overall structure that allows for you to do those things. It tells you when to do them and why you can do it. Does that make sense? And we're going to start analyzing those procedures, guidelines that lay all that stuff out for us. Okay? Uh, and, and like I said, they're, they're presented in if then statements throughout theorems, definitions, corollaries, limos, um, all these groupings of statements, um, postulates, we've already seen some of those. Uh, all written as if then statements. So trying to get you to read, be able to read mathematical text, okay? And understand when I read it, what do I get from that, okay? Um, so an if, an if then statement is the, the generic definition we're gonna give a conditional. Um, when we write, when we read these, okay, so I'm gonna write just kind of a generic if then statement here for us real quick. Shut up. All right, so if you are in geometry, then you are in Mr. Face class. Is that something we would say is an instant statement? Right? Okay. Um, this is what we call the hypothesis. That part right there. Okay? And that part is what we want to address. We want to make sure that, that is happening. Before I even look at the then part. Because if that's not, if I'm not in geometry, then there's no way that then part could be true. Because if I'm not in geometry, there's no way you're going to be in space class, right? Okay. Um, when, when we look at this, guys, when we um, start 
deciding and, and talking about the structure of if-then statements. That is referred to as our hypothesis. And think about any if-then statement you may, you might have asked your parents, can I borrow the car? They might say, if you clean your room, you can borrow the car. Okay? Uh, if you mow the grass, you can have an allowance. Okay? Uh, those types of things, right? Those are all if-then statements they will even occur, uh, uh, be countered as, as humans. Okay? Uh, there's all kinds, and you, you've probably experienced close to, I don't know, 100,000 of them in your life, okay? even more. Okay, All of those if statements, we kind of abbreviate or wrap up into what we call a P statement. So that P is kind of substituted in saying, these are all the infinite if statements, all these general hypotheses that we come up with. Okay? The conclusion, which in our original one would have been this, you are in Mr. Faye's class. That um, is, okay. That statement there uh, is our conclusion. That's what we get after we meet the condition of being in geometry class. Okay. Well, there's a lot of different conclusions. Like if I clean my room, then I get the car. Well, get the car would be a conclusion, right? Okay. Um, if it rains, then the grass is wet. Well, the grass is wet would be a conclusion, right? So there's a lot of different conclusions that can be written. So we call those Q. Okay? And, and the reason we do this is because when written as if P, then Q, all those infinite P statements and all those infinite Q statements should all have some type of link to them. So there, there are similarities with all characteristics that are the same within all P and all Q statements. Okay? So this is what we're trying to kind of target. Uh, the the P statement is called the hypothesis. The Q statement is called the conclusion. The way I remember that is, you guys write a, write a paper. What's the last paragraph you would write? It's the conclusion, right? Because it comes at the what of the paper. The end, right? You wrap up all your thoughts. You you draw back ties that to the whole paper that you've seen throughout uh, the body of your your, your paper and all that kind of stuff. You conclude your arguments, correct? It's at the end. So when we talk about conclusions and if-then statements, it's the stuff that's at the end. Okay? It's the stuff that comes after the word then. Okay? Uh, the hypothesis then by default is the stuff before that. It's the stuff that comes after if. Okay? Uh, a couple different ways you're going to see this. We can write it as if P then Q like I have here. Okay? But a lot of times, if we're just talking about the generic symbols or symbolism of this process, we call this, we write it this way. Get my cursor to work here. See that symbol? Whoa. See that symbolism right there? P, then arrow, and then Q. Okay. We read that as, even though words aren't there, we read it as if P, then Q. Or we reread re it as P implies Q. Okay. P implies Q. So if P is true, it means Q is going to be true. Okay. Um, so that is. Two different ways of saying the exact same thing. So when you see the word implies, you can delete it and put if out in front, and then then where you put the word where the word implies was. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay. Um, you can also see at times the Venn diagram approach. Think about this. Let me go back to what I had here. If you are in geometry, then you are in Mr. Fay's class. This is the P statement. Okay, so Venn diagram wise, it would put me where my cursor is, right? It would put me in that bubble. Okay, is that bubble within a larger bubble of Mr. Face class Q? Does that kind of make sense? So if if we are satisfying the first statement, if the then or sorry, if the if part is true, if you're in geometry, we get a conclusion that you're in Mr. Face class. Okay. Now, if I were to reverse that, let's think about reversing this because this is the next question. On the next idea. Let's reverse this. Whoa! Uh -huh. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> uh, if, if you are in Mr. Faye's class, then you are in geometry. Okay, so what that means is that you put your cursor anywhere in the Q stuff, right? Because now the Q stuff I rewrote first. So if I'm in that dark orange, does it necessarily mean I'm in that little P bubble? No, think about this. Could you be in Mr. Face left to be taking trigonometry, taking college algebra, right? I teach those courses as well. So 
reversing statements isn't really something that we want to do a lot. Okay, at least when something when, it, when a phrase is provided for us initially, and it says this is a true conditional, we might not want to reverse it because when we reverse it, we might not get the same truth back. Okay, and, and that's really what the rest of this chapter is about. Our section is about is talking about when it's appropriate and when it's not appropriate to reverse things. Okay, this slide just another way of showing you and identifying what the hypothesis and conclusion is. Uh, I don't think you need to write that down again. Um, don't write this down. What this is saying is just when, when you guys are working inside Math Excel, it asks you basically what's going to happen is they're going to give you a sentence, an if then sentence, and they're going to have some bubbles below it with like four or five other options, and they're going to say pick the hypothesis. Well, the hypothesis will not have the word if inside. Does that make sense? Okay. And the conclusion when they ask you to pick that, it will not have the word then inside. Okay. So the words if and then are more identifiers for us to determine where the hypothesis and conclusion start and end, but they are not part of the hypothesis and conclusion. Is that all right? Okay. Um, it's really not a big deal, uh, but that's just something that you might encounter as you as you start working through some stuff. Okay. Um, yes. Huh? Don't worry about. It. I actually did not the power was out. Huh? Power was out at my house. Did a storm go through? My house? I heard Exact. When we when we start going through this stuff, guys, I'm going to um, try to give you like an elementary example, kind of a, a simple everyday run of the mill type if then statement that has really no math behind it. Uh, and then see if we can understand because usually it's a little bit easier to, to understand the aspects of if-then statements if we do that, and then try to compare it to a math statement, okay? So here it says, if you have a daughter, then you are a parent. Would you guys agree that that's true? If you have a daughter, then you are a parent. The definition of a parent says it is someone who has a child, right? Is a daughter a child? Yeah, okay? So we would talk now, whether I'm a good parent or anything like that, that's not being discussed here, okay? But if I have a daughter, then I am a parent, okay? So the question is, is this reversible okay can i take this statement let's reverse it and say if you are a parent then you have a daughter okay is that a true statement not always right sometimes it is right okay that would be true for me i have a daughter okay but would it be true for somebody that has all sons as well does that make sense? Okay. So just because we see an if-then statement and we gain information from that if-then sta if statement, if you have a daughter, then you're a parent. We gain some thought there. We gain some, some rules, some, some properties. You can't reverse that and say that I gain more information when I reverse it. Does that make sense? Or similar information when you reverse it. Okay. So if-then statements are sometimes reversible. Sometimes they're not. Okay. Kind of a rule of thumb is that if we have a definition, okay? If we have a definition, definitions are reversible. Think about this. If I write this one, um, I'll just write it in place of these. If an angle is 90 degrees, then it is a right angle. Agree with that? Let's reverse it. If it is a right angle, then it has a measure of 90 degrees. It says the same thing, right? My fingers don't want to work today. All right. If an angle is 90 degrees, then it, has, it is a right angle. If it is a right angle, then it is 90 degrees, right? Do you agree both of those are true? Okay. And the only reason that's reversible is because it's going off the definition. Think about like all your tests and quizzes that you have definition questions on vocabulary on. I could give you the vocabulary word and you give me the definition, right? Or I could give you the definition and you spit back the vocabulary word, right? Okay? Because of that kind of two-way street there, we can say the if-then statement could be reversible. Okay? Um, but going back to that parent one. Huh? Well, let me go back. If we go back to if you uh, 
have a daughter, then you are a parent. That's not reversible. If I said if you have a child, then you are a parent. Is that reversible? Now it is. Okay. Uh, so those are some things to think about as we start kind of uh, investigating new if-then statements that have some math behind them. These are two if-then statements that we were provided as positive at the beginning of the year. It says if two distinct lines intersect and they do so at one point. Okay. We want to take that for what it says. Okay. Because they wrote it that way, we are not going to reverse it. Okay. Um, if they wanted us to reverse it, they would write it again in a reverse manner. Does that make sense? Everything that you are provided in a math text, okay, the reason they provide it, the manner or the structure they do, is for you to interpret it in a certain way. When it's written as an if-then statement, they want you to interpret it that way only. Okay, you're not reversed. Is it okay with everybody? Okay. Um, I will talk about later on in the week how we are presented with a certain structure that says this, because of this phrasing, it is reversible. Okay. Um, but in your work, guys, in, in this class, when I start giving you theorems, corollaries, uh, postulates, and they're written as an if-then statement only, that's just the way you think about it. That is the only way you think about it. Until I tell you, we can reverse it right now as this if-then statement, and that new if-then statement will actually effectively reverse it. Okay? Do not make assumptions. Okay? We talked about this before. Assumptions about a phrase can get you in trouble, right? Okay, uh, and that's that's how we read math. Okay, they're going to present us with the way they want us to interpret it and use it. Do not change it and try to use it any way that you want to. Okay, uh, we get to. I'm going to come down to this slide first. Okay, At, because we've already kind of talked about some of these things, like asking whether this is true or false, or anything like that. Uh, when we read a statement, we read an if then statement. We're interested a lot of times if it's true or false. Okay. The truth value of it is that idea of whether it's true or false. Okay. Um, if you're thinking about, if anybody knows anything about programming or coding, uh, it, it all kind of dwindles down to binary zeros and ones, right? You've heard that before? Okay. Um, I'm not sure which one means uh, true, which one means false, but uh, when, when I push the up key on my keyboard, there, there's some coding in the back, basically a bunch of zeros and ones, and we get all the way down to the kind of nitty gritty of it um, that says yes the up arrow was pushed or no the up arrow was not pushed okay true it pushed false is not pushed does that kind of make sense um, now there are little packets of things like html and java and cc plus and those types of things uh, or c plus uh, plus that allow you to kind of take all that binary true and false statements and write them in the kind of better phrases that allow us to work a little bit easier with encoding and programming. But we're interested in true or false. Everything you go through and every day when you come in contact with a decision, an if-then statement, you think about, okay, is it true or false? Okay? If it's true, do this. If not, how do I react? Okay? Uh, in order to show a conditional is true, that's what we're going to be thinking about mathematically. In order to show a conditional is true, you need to show that every single time the hypothesis is true. Every single time that the if part is true. All right? And basically what we're going to be saying there, if I want to try to show that the if part is true, I just take every, I take the idea or the, the logic that if this is occurring in front of me, if the if part is happening right now, okay, then I need to show that the conclusion is true on top of that. Okay? So if I go back to the one about parents, okay, Let's put the example in here real quick. Oh, text. So if you are a parent, or sorry, if you have a daughter, then you are a parent. So what that phrase is getting at, guys, about... trying to show that a, a conditional statement is true is that I have to, every single time that that is true, every single time that I have somebody in front of me that has a daughter, can I prove, can I show that they are then also a parent? Does that make sense? Okay. Every single person that comes in front, every time that I see that somebody has a daughter, I have to be able to say that they're a parent. And we can do that, right? 
Okay? To show that it's false would be something like this. If I had if oh, reverse it and say if you are a parent, then you have a daughter. That situation would be okay. If I want to show this to be true, every time that I have somebody in front of me now that's a parent, I have to be able to confirm that they have a daughter, and that's what made them a parent. Does that make sense? And we know that that's not always the case, right? So this would be a situation I could find a what we call a counterexample. It says, okay, if this is true, if you are a parent, a counterexample of this could be that you have a son, right? Okay. So that having a son would be a contradiction to this thing being uh, true, uh, and, and it provides us that one counterexample that we need. Does that make sense, everybody? So we need to have that if part. I, I always view this, especially when we start talking about the math content, I always think about that as the picture that's in front of me, okay? If I were to draw that down, okay, um, can I then come across the conclusion that this conditional statement is provided? Okay. If I were to be able to look at all the parents that exist, and I'm looking at every one of them, can I draw the conclusion then that every one of them have a daughter? In this case, I can't, right? Um, but if I looked at this one, okay, if I look at all the people that have daughters that have ever existed, I can then say, yeah, it makes sense that they're their parents. That conclusion can be drawn. Is it okay with everybody? Okay. Um, this is what kind of makes the math aspect in regards to kind of the logical thinking and we're going to talk, talk about proofs uh in a couple days makes it difficult okay because if i want to prove something i have to show it for every single possible situation that would ever exist okay but if i want to prove something false i need to come up with one example so it's much easier to show something false than it is to show something true does that make sense okay um so it says to show the, that, that A conditional, to show that A conditional is false, you must find at least one counterexample for which the hypothesis is true and the conclusion is false. I think I did some... There we go. And the conclusion is false. Okay. So if you have a daughter, then you are a parent. That is true. I cannot find a counterexample of that. If you look at the reverse of that, we could find one counterexample. Okay. Um, something to think about is that you could have an infinite number of situations where you're coming up with, yes, this conditional is true. Yes, it's true every single time I come across it. But there might be one situation hiding out there okay, that's going to provide it to be false. And that one bad false statement is enough to kind of holistically cancel everything else that was true. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, I, I like to take the example, um, you know, if, if I'm going to be an A student, and I, we might be going to extremes here, but if I was going to be an A student, then I need to be an A student on day one, day two, day three, day four, all the way up to day 180, right? Okay? And, and I would I would then prove that I'm an A student, okay? But if I'm an A student for, you know, the first 45 weeks, or 45 days, and then I'm a, an F student for 10 days, and then I go back to being an A student for the rest of the year, was I legitimately an A student? Or was I at times an F student, right? Okay. So I had so I had some some situations, some instances that contradicted that statement. Okay, that's a counterexample. Okay. We need to be able to show that I'm an A student every single day. Alright? Um, one situation being False is enough to say the whole thing is false. You heard the, the phrase that one bad egg kind of ruins the whole the whole batch, right? Okay. One person can be uh, a, a total turd in a class, and, and and the teacher then kind of makes that a consequence for everybody, right? You've been in those situations, okay? Um, it's that idea. Okay, you would have 25 angels and one turd, and uh, that's it, kind of going to be a bad class, right? We're, we're looking for that one bad situation. So do some examples of this, okay? Um, finding counterexamples, okay? Counterexample, like I said, is an example that shows that an argument is false or incorrect, okay? Just, a, a, just an elementary, lame example here. If the ground is wet, then it is raining, 
Can you find maybe some example that would contradict that and say that if the ground is, we have to make sure this is true, okay? So we've got to make sure that that is true before I even get into thinking about the fact of whether it's rain or not. If that is true, if I go outside, open the door, ground wet, does that automatically mean that it's been raining? No, what is the counterexample? Okay, so I'm going to go smoke water on the floor, right? Uh, could the sprinklers have been on? Could there have been dew on the grass? Okay? Uh, there's all kinds of things that could lead to the ground being wet. So those would all be counterexamples. All right? Let's talk about that idea mathematically. Okay? If this was a true statement, if this was always true, it could potentially be provided to you in a textbook published as a fact that we need to know forever. Okay? But because it's not true, I'm going to see that's not true, it was never presented to us as a fact. Okay? But it says, if for all real numbers, x. Okay? So we're talking about all real numbers, that's just your number line. Any value off the, the x-axis that you want to pluck off. Okay? It could be a whole number, it could be a fraction, it could be a decimal, it could be positive, negative, irrational, rational, whatever. Okay? Well, we got to check all of those. How many numbers are there? There's a lot. What's a better word for a lot? Infinite, right? So to check every one of those, it's not possible. Okay? So to show that this is true, almost impossible the way that we would want to. Okay? But seeing how it's false isn't, isn't all that bad. But let's start picking out some values. Okay? We have to meet, sorry, we have to meet this condition first. So I have to be using real numbers. Well, you guys don't know anything about things that are not real numbers yet. I don't think you guys have talked about imaginary numbers at any point, have you? Okay. Um, so th th just any number that I think of. Okay, so let's try one. That's a real number. When I square one, what do I get? I get one back, right? Is one greater than or equal to one? Okay. So true. Well, let's put two in. Okay? If I put two in, square that, I get four, right? Is four greater than or equal to two? Yep. True. So we get some true examples here. Let's try three. Plug three in. Square that, you get nine. Is nine greater than or equal to three? True. So now we're starting to see a pattern, right? This number is going to grow. But this one grows exponentially, right? It gets a lot bigger, a lot faster. Is this always going to be true for positive numbers? Okay. So that's good. We got a lot of true statements. But that's not enough to say that we have the ability to say this is always a true conditional. Let's try the number zero. What do I get if I plug zero in? Zero. Is zero greater than or equal to zero? Yep, that's a true statement. What about a negative number? Let's try negative one. Negative one plugged in, I get one, right? Is one greater or equal to negative one? Yep. What if I try negative two? Get four back, right? Is four greater than or equal to negative two? So I'm getting a lot of true values back, right? A lot of true statements back. There's a, there's a counterexample somewhere. Anybody know what the counterexample is? Or a potential for a counterexample? Okay, get what fraction? One half or, okay? Now I asked for what, because there, there's, a, there's kind of a cutoff. Um, because if I use like, if I use five halves, which is 2.5, if I square that, I get 6.25, okay? Well, 6.25 is greater than 2.5, right? But if we try one half, what do I get if I square one half? One fourth. Okay. So now can I say the argument is one fourth greater than or equal to one half? No, that's a false statement, right? Okay. So just kind of a snapshot, we did like nine, ten, eleven individual specific examples, right? And they came out to be true. But it wasn't until maybe the twelfth or thirteenth example that we get a false statement. You might go through that process where you come up with a thousand, two thousand, an infinite number of true examples. 
There might be one false example lingering out there somewhere that we need to address because it makes everything false. Does that make sense, everybody? And that one that's got a hide, it's got a needle in a haystack sometimes. It's hiding, it's really hard to find. But that's what we need to be able to try to kind of direct our minds to. Okay? Uh, and every time, every every situation, every type of if Zen statement is a little bit different. Okay? Um, this one allowed me to maybe set up a table and make some arguments and, and, and do the data that way. Others, I might have to draw pictures. Uh, but we're, we're trying to make these arguments about whether these statements are true or not. Okay? Um, that's the hard part about proofs, guys. Because when we get to proofs later this week, early next week, you're going to say, well, I can do it with specifics. I can do it with specific values. That's great. But you need to then be able to do it with an infinite number of specific values, which is impossible for you to do anything infinite number of times, right? If we can't do it an infinite number of times, we've got to have another technique, another strategy that that does do that for us, okay? And, and that's what proofs will do. Uh, but we got to be able to understand this kind of structure of sentences before we can get there. Um, whenever you negate something, this is English, okay? Negating something in English, you guys do this all the time with contractions, right? Do not change this into don't and won't, will not and won't, right? Okay. Uh, so when when I negate something, I'm bringing in the word not. Okay. Uh, so for instance, if, if, if I have a statement that says the water is cold, the negation of that would be the water is not cold, right? Is that okay, everyone? Uh, if my statement, if my overall statement is P, okay, like we've talked about, the hypothesis is P. Then I write this little symbol out here. That little, I think you call that a tilde in Spanish, don't you? Something like that. Okay. We say it's not P. Okay. So that little squiggly out front is it stands in for the word not. Okay. That's something mathematically that we do a lot is that we, we have these phrases that we don't want to write out in words. So we come up with shorthand symbols. Okay. Um, you know, you're equal to your equal symbol, your greater than less than symbols, all those things are similar. Okay. Uh, this is just the one that represents not. Okay. Um, make sure that you you put it in there grammatically uh, so that things make sense. You don't want to say the not water is cold, okay, or not the water is cold. You guys watch Star Wars? Not Yoda, right? Okay. Um, Toss backwards. Okay. So um, make sure that you put the negation in grammatically so that you you sound intelligent okay uh, but every one of our conditional statements is going to lead us to three others okay and this is how we create those three other uh, conditions all of these are if then statements so they're all collectively conditional statements okay but they relate back to an original okay so um, whenever I talk about the converse or the inverse the contrapositive Understand that it's a specific type of conditional that relates back to an original statement. Okay. So, I'll zoom in on this so we see a little bit better. Alright, so, a conditional, this one will be provided, this original here will be provided for us. Okay, so it just says use the given hypothesis and conclusion. Basically saying that's, that's what's being written for you and that's what you're going to use then to come up with these other three. Okay. Um, so we're looking here that uh, it says if measure of angle A equals 15 degrees and angle A is acute. That's an if then statement, right? Okay. We'll talk later about whether that's true or false. That's just an if then statement. We've seen symbols that says P implies Q or P arrow Q. All right. And that should match up to, to what this phrase is saying. This is about, remember, P is your hypothesis, Q is your conclusion, hypothesis comes first, conclusion comes second, and we read it if P then Q. Okay. Now, if I take that original, I want to create what we call the converse. And the original and the converse become very, very important sentence structures for us in this class. Because the converse is actually saying, okay, if we reverse it, is that okay? Do we get something similar? Because I can take any phrase, give you any if then statement, and reverse it, right? But then whether it's true or false, that's really what's, what's saying we can or we cannot reverse it and apply the information that's gained out of that. Um, but the converse is just flip-flopping. Change the hypothesis and conclusion. Change your spots. Okay? 
right. So in this example here, you see how if this was my original, okay, just kind of use the color coding here. They took the conclusion, which is A is acute, right? And they wrote that as the hypothesis. They put that after the word if. Okay. And then in the original, the red was the hypothesis. In the converse, they make that the conclusion. And you see over here in the symbolism that all that happened was the P's and Q's flipped order, right? The hypothesis and the conclusion changed plots. Is that okay there, everybody? So that's how we can construct the converse. We just flip-flop the if and then. The inverse, okay, coming down here, the inverse says you negate both parts of the condition. So we go back up to the original, back up to the original, and now we just negate both parts. Put the word not in there, okay? Now this one, this says angle... You know, that one says right there, measure of angle A is 15, right? This symbolism here says measure of angle A is not 15. So putting that slash through my equal sign negates it, right? Equals means it is from last year, correct? Okay, so when I put that slash through, it means it's not. So we negate the first part, and then we say angle A is not acute. We negate the second part. Is that all right there, everybody? So the converse is flipping them. The inverse is negating them. Okay? The contrapositive, kind of a weird word, but that is doing both things. So both things we've already done. We flip it and we negate. We do both the inverse and converse kind of structures to the original. Okay? So if you look at this, you see that the red one goes to the end, right? So the red hypothesis here becomes the conclusion, and the blue conclusion becomes the hypothesis down here, right? Does that make sense? And then they incorporate the word not into both parts of that. So we negate both parts and we flip both parts. Okay? And that creates those four sentence structures. Now what's useful for that, or why do we talk about that? We want to talk about whether these statements are true or false. And think about this. When we talk, talk to you about every time that I want to determine whether it's true or false, the if part has to be what is occurring in front of you. You have to have this in your hands or on your paper or, or whatever, but it has to be what's occurring in front of you. I'm trying to get my highlighter here. Okay, so we're looking at that right there. Eventually that there. That. And that. So these highlighted parts, and when I go through and talk about these sentences being true or false, we want to make sure that we understand that in order for me to make an argument of whether it's true or false, that, that blue part has to be occurring in front of you. So if you have an angle that is 15 degrees, that is what is in front of you on your paper, then the angle A is cute. Is that true or false? That's true. That is always 100% of the time true. You can never find a counterexample that that would be false, right? Let's go to that second one. If angle A is acute, then measure of angle A is 15. So in front of me, I have an acute angle. When you have an acute angle in front of you, does it mean then that it has to be 15 degrees? No, what's the pattern again? Could be 16 degrees, right? Could be 14 degrees, could be 35 degrees. There's a, there's a lot of counter examples that say this is false. Because if it was true, if it was true, then we're saying every acute angle is a 15 degree angle. And we know that's not true, right? It's not the definition of acute. All right, so I go to this next one. If angle A is not 15, so if it's not 15, it's any number except for 15, right? Then angle A is not acute. If it's not acute, what's it gotta be? Obtuse or right, correct? Or straight, so it's a straight, let's, let's just say that straight is part of obtuse. Um, it's not necessarily, but um, I'm just gonna have to write anything else down. So if measure of angle A is not 15, does it mean that it has to be obtuse or right? Are there angles that are not 15 that are still acute? Yeah, okay. So again, my counter example here might be 14. Because if it's not 15, it could be 14. Would a 14 angle, 14 degree angle not be acute? No, you see how this is false? 
And now I get down to this one. So this angle A is not acute. You got an angle from If it's not acute, then it has to be right, obtuse, or straight, right? The measure of angle A cannot be 15. Is that true? If it's not acute, it has to be obtuse, right, or straight, right? Those are my options based off of what's happening in front of me. The measure of angle A cannot be 15. Is that true or false? That's true. Because yeah. if it's obtuse, it's got to be greater than 90, right? If it's right, it's got to be 90. If it's straight, it's got to be 180. So we're looking at numbers that are between 90 and 180 inclusive. So there's no way it can be 15. All right, there's an easier way to do this. These last two, I think, were hard. You guys think when you put the words not in, it's hard to decide whether they're true or false? Okay. What happens is if you know your conditional is true, okay? If you know your conditional is true, your constant positive is going to be true as well. If you know your conditional is false, your constant positive is going to be false as well. Okay? So those two statements always have the same truth value. Look at your inverse and converse. They were both false, right? If my converse is true or false, my inverse is true or false. Okay? Uh, so they match up the same way. Converse is true, inverse is true. Converse is false, inverse is false. Does that make sense to everybody? And that is the, the link. That's what we're trying to get through the whole period here. Is at some point you're going to be given an if this statement that has words like not in it that are really hard to decide if it's true or false. If I can restructure it to get the words not out of there, I would be able to maybe answer my true or false question a little bit better. Does that make sense? So let's say I start you off with that bottom true or false, that bottom if then thing. If angle A is not acute, the measure of angle A is not 15. That's hard to answer. But if I negate both parts, so I start off with this being my conditional. If I negate both parts, and flip-flop the, uh, the hypothesis and conclusion, it would give me this, right? Was this one easy to answer as being true? So then I can automatically answer this one as being true as well. Does that make sense to everyone? All right. And those are little things that we'll try to work on throughout the year. Because some of our theorems and some of the, the, the statements we come across are going to be hard to decipher. Is this true? Maybe we come up with something on our own. Is this true? But let's negate it and flip and do that kind of stuff and see if those statements are true or false. And that might shed light on then the statement that we came up with or that we're dealing with specifically, okay? Uh, so this, this stuff, guys, we're gonna keep building on tomorrow, but the hope is that it kind of starts to build a, a, a way for us to read and understand what they're providing us, okay? When they write something for us, they want us to think about it just the way they wrote it. There is a MAGA cell assignment, 2.2. .2. Absolutely. <laughs>